So without further ado, um, so today we're going to be talking about Shamir's secret sharing in the Pedersen DKG, which is the foundation of most threshold ECDSA and threshold EDDSA protocols. Um, we'll also be talking about VLS signatures. So the, the core intuition here is to get a little bit of a sense for how multi-party computation works. And in multi-party computation, we're generally looking to grab a group of people to compute some value where each participant in the, in the protocol wants to maintain some secret uh, over the course of the protocol. So for instance, in the case of, of threshold signing, um, if we have a secret key, we might split the secret key up into key shares uh, where each party would hold on to one of those key shares. And the ideal would be that we could eventually construct a, a signature without ever having any party reveal their, their key share. So that's gonna, what we're gonna be sort of working up to part of in this lecture. And um, we'll get to a little bit later in the lecture, um, BLS signatures, which are sort of like the, the platonic ideal of like what you would expect from a threshold signature scheme. Though many times we're, we're sort of stuck with, uh, if your verifier verifies an ECDSA signature or a Schnorr signature, um, you still do need to produce an ECDSA or Schnorr signature for that verifier to verify. Now, uh, the sort of introduction to BLS signatures should make clear that ECDSA and Schnorr signatures are not the one-size-fits-all kind of signature for every job. In the case where we want aggregate signatures, they're actually quite frustrating to work with because we don't get this non-interactivity property. But we'll get to that in a second. So starting with uh, Shamir's secret sharing. Um, or just any the idea of secret sharing in general. We have this idea that if we want t out of we want t out of uh, t parties out of n possible parties, like for instance, if we have Alice, Bob, Carl, and David, maybe we only want two, or we only we want to allow Alice and Bob to to do something together, or Carl and David to do something together, or Bob and David to do something together. Um, so the two in that case, or t would be two in that case where the n was four. So we want to construct some way for two parties out of a possible total number of parties to do something. And in particular, the, the example that I just gave is, is we, maybe we want them to be able to construct a signature. Um, and there's a really trivial way to do this um, in the case of signatures, which is called a multi-signature. So in the multi-signature context, um, we just say, here's a central verifier. And we say Alice, Bob, Carl, and David make any two, and this is going to be a two of four central verifiers before. Alice, Bob, Carl, and David uh, can produce um, a signature, and we can have the central verifier say, well, if I got two signatures in um, I will check that these two signatures are valid. And if these two signatures are valid, then output the final signature. Um, and that would be a way to construct a multi-party signature scheme where Alice, Bob, Carl, and David all sit on a private key. So we'll say that they all have some private key. Uh, and the, the problems here is that the central verifier is one, trust, you have to trust that guy. And two, you have to verify T, uh, you have to verify T signatures for every signature out. So that's no good. Um, or at least it's, it's not as good as we could do. Um, so this central verifier, uh, in blockchain world, we usually spell central verifier smart contract. Um, we, can have a, we can have a smart contract to verify uh, whatever it is that we, we want to verify. And it's not always particularly convenient to have cryptography done on a smart contract where, where blockchains are sort of infamously uh, excellent at being slow computers, right? So if we could find some way to have Alice, Bob, Carl, and David perform a offline process to produce this uh, this desirable uh, final signature, 
that is something that threshold signatures accomplish. So that's sort of what we're going to be gesturing at today when we start talking about uh, DKGs. Uh, so before I move on, that was kind of a, a whirlwind. Um, are there any questions about um, kind of what we're going for here? We're going for like specifically this offline process where we don't have to have the central verifier. All right, cool, let's move on. So like there's a couple of ways that we might start um, and all of this is going to lead up to, um, we just want some way to share a, a secret amongst these uh, N different parties. And so there are a couple of ways we might do that. So we have like some secret X um, and we'd like to split it into secret shares S1 through SN. And we'd like there to be uh, a way to say, if we pick any T out of N of these key shares, we can recover X. And more in particular, a, a threshold signature scheme would say, not only can we recover X, but we can, uh, we can use those secret key shares to construct a valid signature. And so we're gonna take a couple of bad tries. Like the very sort of like, okay, well, maybe we can just split it up, kind of brute force, not, nothing sophisticated here. Um, well, what if we just split up uh, the, the secret X into a bunch of shares? So S1, S2, S3, and so on. And we just hand out, if S is this string, A, B, C, D, up through six, um, we just split it up into all of these different shares. Um, well, then obviously, if we had S1, S2, S3, and S4, then the parties holding those shares would be able to reconstruct X. So that does achieve sort of our, our goal here in, in that we can have, say, some access structure and we can try to be clever about it. We can say, like, give people these such and such shares at the end of the day, we're going to come out with a, a problem that is, if we don't have a particular share that has, like, say, the, the coordinate C, um, then we're kind of uh, stuck. But it's actually worse than that, because we're not actually stuck. Um, because each of these shares re reveals information about the secret. Um, for each new share, um, you, you get information about the secret, and you get just a little bit closer to brute forcing the, the secret, which is usually something like a private key. So you wouldn't necessarily want to reveal any more information necessary than necessary about the, the private key. So if we could do better than this, if we could construct shares um, that one, we didn't need um, some particular shares to reconstruct the private key, and, and two, um, each share should not reveal much information, ideally no information about X um, without the sufficient access, the, the threshold, that would be neat. And so we're going to achieve uh, we're going to achieve the first of those principles with or the first of those goals with with try two, um, and try two is um, sort of hand wavy here, but the the core of it is is basically um, so there there are these things called error correcting codes, and with error correcting codes we basically say okay encode the the string x, um, and basically extend the string with some extra bits. And these bits are something that you can use to say, well, if you have at least uh, some fraction of the string, um, even not the whole string, then you can use the bits that you do have to reconstruct information about the string. So if instead of splitting the string up into, uh, into parts as we did before, if we, if we ex append the, the, the error correcting code bits, E1 through EN, onto the string and then hand those out as part of the, the secret shares, then actually we have good news. We no longer run into the problem where as before, uh, in this example, S1 was the only share that had um, element A and element, or the, 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 the first and second elements of the, of the secret. Um, with this error correcting code approach, we can actually say that we, we've solved the issue of like, well, we have to have S1 in this scenario. Um, because we can use these error correcting codes to reconstruct whatever missing indices we happen to not be able to find. And so that actually does solve the first problem. We, we now have a fully general sort of like approach to constructing a T out of an access structure, but it doesn't solve the, the second issue. And the second issue was specifically that um, ideally we would like it to be hard to brute force the secret without the actual access structure. So if we had T minus one uh, shares in this scheme, um, we would be pretty close to just being able to brute force the private key at that point, which is no good. 
Um, so this, this, this does work at constructing the access structure, but it doesn't work at maintaining the secrecy of, of X. In fact, it's, it's too powerful. The, uh, the access structure, um, incrementally moves closer and closer to this, to, to T or to the, to the secret. And ideally we would like to construct our, our access structure such that this is not the case. So, uh, error correcting codes are too powerful. Um, we want something less powerful. Um, so. Yeah, so each party obtains information about the secret. Uh, and beyond that, there's also the problem that we just imposed a significant extra storage cost in that this uh, error correcting code um, can be quite long, depending on how, how, how strong we want our access structure or how, how, what our threshold exactly needs to be. Um, so try take three. And so this is actually Shamir's secret sharing. So take three is that we we might say let's let's encode our secret as some point in a higher dimensional space, and we can say with with um, some degrees of freedom. Um, if we have say like arbitrary degrees of freedom on on this on this function in this other in this other space, um, it would be impossible to obtain x without constraining all of those degrees of freedom, which is very abstract, kind of hand wavy, but. Exactly what we're going to do now is we're going to say, okay, so what kind of space is convenient for this? Um, and there's an extremely convenient representation in the form of polynomials. So taking a degree one polynomial, which is just a line. Uh, so degree one polynomial, uh, the line, uh, has the convenient property that if we if we pick any two spots on the line, um, say these two spots, uh, we have entirely reconstructed the line. And if we know that it's a degree one polynomial, um, then we, we can take any two spots. It can be these two spots. It can be these two spots. It can be whatever spots we want to choose along this line. And if we get two spots along the line, that is, we get two uh, secret coefficient or two, two, two points along this polynomial uh, f of z equals and this is this is wonderful I've managed to put an x where there should be a z um, if we take any two points along this this polynomial here um, then we can reconstruct uh, the entire line and then we can say well how would we like to encode our secret well, let's call our secret a0 um, just for convenience and let's say our secret is where the line intersects the y axis so when we plug z equals zero into our polynomial, we get back simply a zero, which is our secret. So this is very convenient. This is a sort of scheme that allows us to say, okay, so we can hand out arbitrary information about the polynomial. And um, in fact, we aren't limited to handing out just two points. We have say 10 people and we want any two of them to be able to reconstruct the secret. Um, we can pick 10 points along the polynomial, say give person at index one the evaluation of the polynomial at one, person at index two the evaluation of the polynomial at two, and so on. And uh, if we have person one and person seven, they can reconstruct the line and then obtain a, a naught. Um, so that wins. Um, that gives us our t out of n axis structure. And additionally, um, the the information given to person one, that is the evaluation of the of the polynomial at the, at the uh, at, at index one, they don't get any information about what the rest of the polynomial is um, because the coefficients still could be anything from the perspective of, of person one. So they get literally zero information uh, about the, the line um, besides that they know one point along it. They don't, they don't win either of the coordinates, a zero or a one. So that's pretty good. And this generalizes up to arbitrary degree polynomials. So this was a degree one polynomial. If we were to say, take a degree three polynomial, um, the same thing that we observed before, um, that we pick any two spots along the degree one polynomial is sufficient to re reconstruct it. Any four, uh, any four spots along the degree three polynomial is sufficient to reconstruct the polynomial. And we do that by Lagrange interpolation, which we will not be discussing in depth in this lecture. Um, it's a decent high school calculus sort of concept. You probably have been exposed to it in the past. Um, so the uh, the win there is, okay, so, so can we pick an arbitrary degree polynomial 
and reconstruct it? Yes, we can. Um, I mean, we can do that with Lagrange interpolation. Um, so this gives us our arbitrary access structure. If we wanted, if we want a, a T of N access structure, we just pick a degree T minus one polynomial and we hand out N points. So uh, where if we had, as, as before, we had 10 participants, any four of their, uh, of their points is sufficient to reconstruct this polynomial. And this is the core intuition behind Shamir's secret sharing, is that we, we just have a polynomial and we can use Lagrange interpolation to share it. Um, so, and, and any fewer points than the, uh, than the um, degree of the polynomial, uh, what was it, degree three, degree of the polynomial plus one um, gives no information about the secret. So this is really good. Like, this is the kind of good that we almost never get in cryptography, where, like, we can give zero information out about the things that we're trying to protect, and we could still obtain an efficient sort of way to encode this information. So really good scheme. Um, so uh, the scheme is basically give out the end participants, uh, point along the degree t minus 1 polynomial, and encode the secret as the y-intercept. And I see there's a couple of questions that have popped up in the chat. Um, and first, a good morning. Good morning. Um, what is the physical device slash software you are using to scribble on? And is the argument that T minus one participants can't brute force the secret in polynomial time? Uh, so the answer to the first question is, uh, this is an iPad that I got in college. Um, and I find it particularly good for specifically this. Um, and the application is Notability. I think I switched over to this from another application a couple of years ago. Um, and just uh, we'll restrain ourselves from showing up the iPad too much. Um, so the yeah, so the, the the application is Notability, and the the app is or the 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 device is an iPad. And then I am streaming it to my desktop with a command line tool called UX Play. Um, now, the next question is, is the argument here that T minus one participants can't brute force the secret in polynomial time? And uh, yeah, so so if, if, the, if the polynomial is degree uh, T, um, you need four uh, points along the polynomial to reconstruct the polynomial. Three points along the polynomial will give you no information about the polynomial. Four will give you the entire polynomial. So the argument here is that t minus one participants, that is for this degree three polynomial, that would be three participants. Um, if, we, if we get rid of one of these, um, then we can construct a parabola, but we can't construct a degree three polynomial. Um, and so there will be a fixed parabola, a single parabola that goes through these three points. Um, but the, um, the, the, th the th uh, degree three polynomial is uh, irretrievable from the perspective of those three collaborating participants. Um, and I can go a little bit more into detail on why this is sometimes interesting from the blockchain perspective, um, maybe as a sort of post-lecture addendum. Um, and I see you're typing here, but I'm going to move on and I'll try to handle that in reasonable time. Um, so yeah, uh, fewer points gives no information about the secret, and as we just discussed, they can't brute force the point. Um, so next up is there's an issue. So in that last scheme, uh, we had, say, a trusted dealer uh, situation, where how did the participants get uh, their points? Who, who gives them these points along the curve um, that they obtain? Well, the, the sort of question of how they got these points in the first place is actually quite thorny, because if they're just handed out the points along the polynomial by, by a trusted Alice, then Alice gets to know the secret. Um, Alice knows the entire polynomial. So Alice is the 
uh, central trusted authority in this case, and that is um, not very useful or not very good if we're, we're sort of trying to have this scheme where no participant knows more than they need to, because Alice knows everything. So the, the issue that we want to solve here is, well, instead of Alice dealing out to Bob, Carl, and David, um, or whoever's participating in this scheme, instead of Alice choosing the, the degree of the polynomial and Alice choosing the points of along which she evaluates the polynomial. Our question is, can we come up with a scheme for Alice and co to, to determine some secrets along a polynomial that none of them know? So in this case, you could think of the, the polynomial itself as uh, sort of this, this polynomial that everyone knows a tiny little bit about, but uh, no one actually knows the polynomial. Um, and the uh, points that they get along the polynomial um, sort of gesture at the polynomial, but no one actually knows what they're all gesturing at, which I find to be a compelling metaphor for life. Um, so that's that's what we're going for, is we want, we want to all be gesturing uh, at the sky and saying that there's a polynomial there that no one actually knows about. Um, now, there's another question in the chat. Is there a difference in the computational difficulty in attacking a scheme between a degree three and a degree five polynomial? No, um, there is not, uh, because, and maybe this is uh, just a rephrasing of your previous question, but um, what I was trying to explain with, uh, with this sort of example is that um, with only three points, uh, let's pick a different color, with only three points, we can pick an arbitrary cubic polynomial that goes whoop, whoop, whoop. Um, and maybe it would intersect the y-axis like way down there somewhere. Or we could say, pick an arbitrary cubic, and we're gonna delete this guy just for the sake of convenience. Or we could pick our polynomial to go like, uh, well, we could have it be a one of these guys. Um, or we could pick our polynomial to be um, one of these guys. Uh, that's, a, that's not an actual polynomial. You get the idea. Anyway, you get the idea. The, the, the premise here is that um, without four points, you can't decode these coefficients um, because they could be any coefficients. They're, they're somewhat bound, but you can still pick an arbitrary fourth point along this, along this space to say, okay, so the polynomial needs to, to fit these four points. Well, you can you can pick at literally any other points in this space, whether it's um, delete some some of those here. You can pick any other point in this space as long as it's not vertically on top of one of the three points you've already picked, and still obtain some cubic polynomial that goes through all four points. So um, this is this is true for for any degree polynomial. If you have fewer than the total number of points, or if you have fewer points than than the degree plus one. Uh, you still have an arbitrary possibility space for what the polynomial could be. So um, is there a difference between a degree three polynomial and a degree five polynomial in the sense that one is safer than the other? No. Um, and this means that we can have arbitrary access structures for our, our secret. And we can say arbitrarily, okay, I want uh, two out of five or three out of seven or 17 out of 42. Um, gives us perfectly arbitrary sort of ways to construct our secret or our access structure. And we generally refer to the T out of N as our access structure for the polynomial. And if we wanted like Alice to be particularly strong, we can also give her like say three points along the polynomial because like maybe Alice matters more than everyone else. It really doesn't matter. Um, so, uh, or, or by it doesn't matter, it's, it's really quite flexible is what I really mean to say. So moving back to de decentralized key generation. Um, so Alice, Bob, Carl, and David are going to try to do some protocol together. And this gets a little bit mathematically bogged down. So I'll try to move slowly here, um, but feel free to speak up with any questions. We basically want to come up with some protocol which allows these parties to generate a, a polynomial that they're all gesturing at that no one knows. Um, so the way we're going to do this is we're going to have them come up with a bunch of random nonsense and contribute that nonsense um, towards the, the shared polynomial. So everyone's going to, excuse me. Okay, yeah, so everyone's going to come up with um, 
a private value u, i, and some private coefficients to some polynomial that they know. So like this is going to be player i, uh, denoted by the uh, subscript i. So player i comes up with their own personal polynomial, um, and every other player comes up with their own personal polynomial. No, no one shares a polynomial because they all just came up with random nonsense. So my personal random nonsense is going to look like this. Uh, I'm going to have um, some coordinate u, i, and some random nonsense in the coefficient slots for a degree t polynomial. Um, and choose degree three, a degree t polynomial um, because we want to end up with a degree t polynomial for a t of n axis structure. So everyone's got their everyone's got their their personal favorite numbers in their polynomial. Um, this is great, but we we want them to all share. Um, some coefficients for a shared polynomial. We want to end up with a, a, a shared polynomial. Um, yeah, so private knowledge here means that uh, this is uh, these these guys are held only by player uh, by me. I'm player I in this case, and public values um, everyone gets to see this. Um, so every player J has access to my public key, and every player J. Um, uh, or yeah, so I, I have access to everyone else's public key and everyone has access to my public key. That's what that means. Um, and the, actually I'm not even sure that this is relevant, so uh, ignore that. Um, yeah, this, this is irrelevant, I think, for the, the sort of uh, slimmed down explanation that I'm giving here. Um, so the, the next step here is that if, um, if I have my polynomial, I can evaluate it at whatever index I want. So suppose that I have the indices of players, suppose there's three players and I'm player one. I'm going to send to player two the evaluation of my polynomial at two. I'm going to send to player three the evaluation of uh, my polynomial at player three. And everyone else is going to do the same. Um, so if, if everyone hands out an evaluation of their private polynomial, uh, if, if I am player one, and let's say I is one here, um, then I'm going to have the evaluation of the polynomial of my polynomial at index one, of player two's polynomial at index one, and player three's polynomial at index one. And that's gonna look like this. So they've got their, they've got their random nonsense, and I've got my random nonsense. And we're going to evaluate it all at i. Um, so the uh, the summation here is everyone evaluated their polynomial at some particular index corresponding to me, and I can add them all together. The insight here is that um, well, we can just say that the coefficients here they're all uh, I is a coefficient here, so we can factor we can factor I out of the the out of each term. So out of the the first term, we have I to the zero. Out of the second term, we have I to the one. Or maybe it would be easier if I started zero indexing. So at the zero term, I have I to the power of zero. At the first term, I have I to the power of one. And the teeth teeth term, the chewy term, I have I to the power of t. And I can factor all of those out. Um, to express the uh, sum of all the values that I got as the, uh, as the sum of my secret plus everyone else's secret um, and my secret coefficient at index one plus everyone else's secret coefficient at index one and so on. Um, and the neat thing about this is that I have this at evaluation i but everyone else has this as a valuation of the index corresponding to them. Um, Skonov asked, is everything in a safe prime field? Um, in this instance, we can be working over any, uh, actually, we, we can be working over a group in this case, um, where the, the value for i would be the group element. And we can take scalar coefficients for each group element because there is no multiplication of group elements in this uh, in this context, or there is no addition of group elements in this context. There's only a uh, we only need one operation over over our group with some scalar field. 
Um, and I think we had a conversation in the Discord maybe a couple of weeks ago about um, what it means that we can have scalar coefficients for group elements. Um, but in a nutshell, um, we can take this operation over any mathematical object that has an operation defined. So we can use a safe prime field if we'd like, but we definitely don't have to. Uh, we can use, this is fairly flexible, we can use basically anything. Um, now, since, since we're usually talking about um, a private key that is living over some safe uh, prime field, um, it's, it is likely that we would be using that. But again, we can use uh, an arbitrary group element. Um, so um, coming back here, um, everyone actually has this coefficient and this coefficient and this coefficient um, evaluate of the polynomial evaluated at some index i. So I have this at index one, person two is this i equals index two, person three is i equals index three. Um, what that means is that every player has an evaluation of this polynomial here, um, which uh, is given here. Let's see if we got that. Okay, well that's a box. Um, yeah, so everyone, every player has an evaluation of this polynomial at the index corresponding to to them, and that means that we've actually we've we've managed to do it. Um, that there is some secret that we all constructed, and it is unknown to every player in this party. That is, um, everyone contributed their little bit of randomness to the secret and everyone contributed their little bit of randomness to each subsequent coefficient. No one knows the actual polynomial, but everyone has an evaluation of the polynomial. And so if we get back to the, uh, this, this degree n polynomial, we all ended up with, with points along the polynomial, but no one actually knows the polynomial. So, th so this is how we can, we can use this scheme to, to come up with uh, such a polynomial where we can say like, okay, so everyone has sort of gesturing information at the polynomial, but no one actually gets the polynomial, which is pretty neat. Um, now, uh, Skonov asked, is this only for n out of n yet? And no, uh, this can be for t out of n because we chose our polynomial to be of degree t. Um, we, we can have all n participants participate in this setup ceremony but um, since our polynomial is of degree t, our final polynomial will be of, and excuse me for not putting a t there. Um, yeah, so our final polynomial will also be of degree t. Um, that means that any uh, t plus one participants in this, uh, any t plus one participants would be able to reconstruct the polynomial by colluding. So this is, uh, this is not for n out of n, but this is the full general case of, of t out of n. And in practice, we tend to do a couple more things that have to do with, um, we, so in the multi-party setting, we have to assume that everyone could be lying. Um, so basically every message that you receive from someone else in the protocol, you need to do, at the very least, you need to verify that the person who sent that message is who they say they are. So verify a signature or some authentication. Otherwise, someone could be pretending to be that person um, and then ruin the protocol. And then besides that, even if you, if you know they are who they say they are, you need to verify that they didn't uh, send crap. Um, because if they sent crap um, and you end up with your final value, um, you might have lost the opportunity to catch the, the cheater um, or the falter um, if you didn't check intermediately at each step along the way. Okay, is this crap? Uh, or can I, con can I convince myself that, they, that they, they did the whole protocol honestly? And this is sort of a property known uh, often as identifiable aborts. So identifiable aborts basically mean, can I tell who did the nonsense? Um, and it usually means that you need to send some proof of nonsense at every message along the protocol. So I'm leaving out some of those proof of nonsense steps for, for simplicity's sake. Um, so so this, this, this scheme was called the Pedersen DKG. Um, it's often expanded with uh, further validity check, uh, sometimes referred to as the Feldman extension to the Pedersen DKG or the Feldman P DKG. 
um, which um, is worth a look up um, if uh, you're interested in secret sharing schemes. Now, Skonov asked, uh, could you show how they hold their points? Um, and I'm not entirely sure what that question asks. Um, because, uh, or maybe this is the, this is the correct sort of gesturing at it. Um, so, so player index I, so like I'm going to be player at index one. I received the evaluation of, um, of the polynomial, the shared polynomial at index one. So I have, everyone has this coefficient plus this coefficient times their index, which for me is one plus and so on uh, up to this coefficient times their index to the value of t. Um, and so Skonoff extended his question, is the private polynomial defined? Uh, I'm not quite sure what is the private polynomial defined the point one hold. Um, yeah, I, so yeah, this is this this value is just the shared polynomial that we, we, we received, um, p of x where x is equal to my index. Um, and so the the thing that everyone ends up receiving after adding together the points that they received from every, every other player is the evaluation of the polynomial at their own index. Um, and if you'd like to talk more about that or, or maybe review um, a blog post, there are there is a blog post that I wrote on the Pedersen DKG in the chat in the in the notes for this week. Um, so what do we win? We won a decentralized key generation algorithm for Alice, Bob, Carl, and David, um, where everyone holds points that gesture towards some shared secret, um, which is the shared polynomial. And this is what's used as the decentralized key gen or the, D the DKG step in uh, most threshold signatures use something similar to this. Um, so yeah. The only other thing that we could possibly do is if instead of a, a sort of shared polynomial uh, where our shared secret is uh, B naught or the addition of all of these, we might also be interested in what a, a shared secret that was a multiplication of a bunch of contributed randomness would look like, um, which I think is used by the uh, Lindell 17 ECDSA uh, signature scheme. So this is not the only way that we can we can sort of uh, construct our shared secret, but it is one of the more common. Um, and so the next question is, um, well, what would like the the sort of ideal version of a of a threshold signature scheme look like, where we could say, here's Alice and here's Bob. Um, and suppose that Alice and Bob signed some message um, where everyone's going to sign the same message. Um, and we wanted to, as we sort of mentioned at the top, we were talking about this idea of the central verifier where we had uh, the verifier add together or do, do the verification of, of signature B and signature C. And if they were both valid, uh, output signature F. Um, where only the, the central verifier holds onto the private key that can create final valid signatures. So this, this sort of like aggregation concept is, well, what if Alice and Bob could communicate to generate a, uh, a valid final signature themselves without a trusted verifier at all? And maybe we are using just Alice and Bob for simplicity, but we actually care about something much more general. We want arbitrary numbers of people to say, Okay, so there is at least uh, some number of people that have contributed their signature and they can aggregate them all together. And if all of the signatures are valid, then this signature should be valid as well. Um, so how do we do that? Um, because that would be pretty neat. Um, it means that we could submit this final signature and only have to verify one signature in, in the verification step. And this is sort of like what we're trying to work towards is if for every valid output signature, I need to verify T input signatures, um, we would uh, we, we have like a, an extra um, overhead of, of T signature verification. So this would be much more efficient if we only had to verify the one signature, the, the final additive signature. So um, we might come up with a, a very simple scheme that relies on the existence of something we covered in I think last week's session fairly briefly, and that's the existence of a pairing. Um, so pairing-based cryptography is fairly powerful. 
Um, but the core premise is that if I have g to the x and h to the y, this is equal to the pairing of g, h, x, y. Um, and so this is the, the core intuition here that I can basically just move um, the exponent out and still come out to um, a convenient representation. Um, and so the, the sort of intuition here is that um, if um, this was instead, say, g to the x, it's wiped here, if we have g, g to the x times h to the y, this does not necessarily equal g h to the x plus y. This does not work. Um, but with a pairing, it does work. And so that's very useful. Um, so um, in this scheme, uh, we're going to say, let Alice have some secret key called x. And let her public key be g to the x. Um, we can come up with a very natural signature scheme if we have access to this parent. And this is not the aggregation case. This is just the normal signature case. Um, so we're going to say, OK, to sign the message m, um, Alice can say, OK, so let's create some succinct representation of m. This is usually why we hash our message, because our message could be quite long. So we're going to hash our, our message to some convenient representation on probably an elliptic curve, because we tend to do pairings of elliptic curves. Um, it's where we tend to do a lot of our cryptography. We're going to hash our message to the curve, and then we're going to exponentiate it to the value of x. And so the first thing that you might ask yourself as a cryptographer is, OK, so I'm the adversary. I'm, I'm, I'm Eve. And Eve is curious, OK, so could I create this signature without knowledge of x, or could I obtain knowledge of x by looking at this? And the next thing that you might think is, okay, so well, could I exponentiate? Um, could these pairings, could I exponentiate um, the power of x without knowledge of x? And after some thinking, you might convince yourself, no, that doesn't seem like it would be easy to do. So only someone with knowledge of x could conceivably compute this, compute this signature. And you would publish the message and the signature over, over, over the message. Now there's been a question: Could these pairing uh, could these pairings be plotted as Cartesian coordinates? Um, so one intuition for pairings that might be helpful is that a pairing over Cartesian coordinates is the dot product, um, where our if we have let's find some space here, if we have uh, a vector v v one equals uh, shall we say x0, xn, and we have v2 equals y0, yn, um, and we just take the dot product v1, v2, um, then that equals the uh, x0 uh, times x plus uh, this guy. Um, and then we might be interested in sort of the property we mentioned before, um, where instead of the exponent of, of this, um, let's say this is, let's move this over here. Um, so if we have e v1 v2 equals the dot product, um, then we might say that e a v1 and let's say b v2 equals um, a b uh, x0 y0 plus um, a b x n y n, which equals a b times this whole mass. Um, which equals a, B times uh, times the pairing uh, X, Y. Um, so um, this is like the how this sort of notion makes sense over Cartesian coordinates. This is a pairing using the dot product over Cartesian coordinates. 
Um, and in this particular case, we don't use the uh, exponentiation sort of, or the, the multiplication notation, but the additive notation. Could that maybe help a bit with the intuition? Cool. Um, so back up to BLS signatures. Um, the, the premise here is that we're going to just move our, our exponents out by the convenience of the pairing. And um, to verify, um, given the public key, g to the x, the message, m, and the signature, sigma, um, and some pairing function, e, um, it's really easy to verify this signature um, because we can just say, well, the, the pairing of uh, Alice's public key and the hash of the message, which we can compute. We have the message and we can compute the hash. We can check if that equals the pairing between the group generator G and the signature. Um, so we can just move the uh, we can just move the value for X out. And this is just expressing the signature um, in its full form. We can just move this guy out to the exponent as well. And now we have arrived at an expression on the left-hand side or an expression on the right-hand side um, that is equivalent. So um, this is a really elegant signature scheme. It's, it's very short and easy to express. Um, it relies on the fact that we have access to this pairing. Um, but if we do have access to this pairing, then we're good to go um, because we just do this check and that's verification. And hopefully I have not yet convinced you um, that aggregation exists for the signature scheme because that's what we're going to handle next. And so aggregation is a couple more steps, um, but not much. It's, it's really quite simple as a sort of extension. So before we had um, a signature from Alice, now we're gonna have a signature from Bob, Bob in dark blue. Um, so Alice publish, publishes her signature, uh, sigma x, and Bob is going to publish his signature, sigma y. And we want to find some way to combine the two signatures um, into one signature. And after about five seconds of thinking, um, we might, it might occur to us that, well, we can just multiply them. Um, because h of m is the same base um, taken to the power of x and the power of y. So if we multiply uh, sigma x and sigma y, um, we do just get h of m to the x plus y. And that's hunky-dory. Works just fine. But before we, we were verifying this with respect to Alice's public key, um, so we're going to need to do something slightly different than verifying with respect to Alice's public key. Well, it turns out we can do the same dumb trip trick uh, and multiply Alice's public key with Bob's public key. We arrive at the now joined public key g equals x plus y. Um, we might ask ourselves really quickly, okay, so um, can we um, can we obtain any information about x or y um, from this multiplication? So Alice knows the value of x, and the answer is no, not really. Um, we can distinguish by the existence of a pairing. Um, something called the SXDH. Uh, that might be a little bit too in these. Pairings allow us to do some a little bit extra differentiation between uh, Diffie-Hellman discrete logs, um, but not enough to actually break them. So that, that, that makes them quite powerful and useful for our cases. So to verify Alice and Bob's uh, signature, back to the sort of matter at hand, we just multiply things together. And then we get um, our sort of aggregation scheme. And it's very elegant. Um, it allows Alice to just publish her message and Bob to just publish his message. And anyone that wants to aggregate all these signatures has to do is they just have to multiply some points together. So if they, want, if they had T signatures that they wanted to aggregate, they just multiply them all together and multiply all the private keys together. And they're off to the races. Um, and the next question is, can we catch cheaters? Do we have this identifiable board property? Well, um, we can. Um, and we can do this by saying, well, since Alice, Bob, and so on published a signature of their own, we can simply say, okay, so if, if it turns out the final signature isn't valid, 
well, we can we can aggregate uh, or we can individually verify Alice, Bob, Alice and Bob's signatures and say, well, who contributed the crap? Um, so we can catch cheaters. We can actually do, do even better than that. We can catch cheaters in a fairly sophisticated way by saying, well, uh, we can we can do like a tree based approach where um, if we know that um, at least one party contributed crap, um, we can take the step up before where we combined the all of the signatures together. Suppose the signatures looked like um, like looked 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 like a tree like this. We can check um, is valid is valid. And we can sort of use that to find who might have contributed the crap or, or how many parties might have contributed crap. So we, we can catch cheaters. Um, and finally, um, we have a convenient scheme to, to um, uh, this is the bit on pairings. So finally, we can put a convenient scheme together to, to compute an aggregate signature. We're going to take a brief walk out to um, what an alternative uh, signature scheme would look like. Um, the um, the alternative in threshold ECDSA world, just for uh, comparison, um, is the paper by Gennaro and Goldfeder from 2020. Um, and they propose a seven round protocol um, where each player in the protocol has to uh, incrementally broadcast um, pieces of the randomness, uh, sort of broadcast their, their, uh, their chosen nonces and negotiate about chosen nonces and do a bit of additive to multiplicative sharing where uh, each party say, says, okay, let's transform our, our, our random nonsense from an additive representation to a multiplicative non nonsense representation. And it all takes place over seven rounds, um, requiring zero knowledge proofs um, and a, a reasonable bit of keeping track of the, of the sort of who possibly could have faulted in the process. This scheme is, is only mentioned because this is a very elegant scheme. Like we, we have a very simple scheme for, a, for an aggregate signature. It's non-interactive, um, it's secure. Um, we can support arbitrary access structure. Um, uh, this is just to sort of demonstrate that as far as like very convenient aggregate signatures go, BLS is really good. Um, the only reason that we would ever use ECDSA threshold signatures is that we couldn't actually change the verifier, that the verifier expects an ECDSA signature. And the same thing is true for EDDSA signatures. The only reason we would stick with a threshold Schnorr signature, Schnorr and EDDSA being the same thing. The only thing, the only reason we would stick with one of those is that we we, we were forced to, um, because obviously this would be much preferable. It's simpler. It's harder to screw up with your implementation details. And uh, I mean, vulnerabilities are already being found in, in threshold signature libraries. There was one found at the uh, end of, uh, or the beginning of last year, uh, it was the alpha raise attack um, on, G on several GT20 implementations. Um, so um, all of that is to say uh, threshold signatures are pretty interesting, but if, if you, you basically had to sort of like have a model of what is the convenient way to implement a multiple party access structure, um, you would use uh, some combination of BLS signatures um, and potentially further tools. Now, one thing we won't get to today is explaining Yao's garbled circuits, um, but there is a link in the uh, in this week's discussion um, on Yao's garbled circuits. And if you're particularly interested, the author even implemented uh, his own garbled circuit library in Rust. So that might be worth looking at as well. Um, so yeah, I think I'd leave you with that today. Um, the homework for this week is to implement your very own uh, BLS signature. Um, and to do that, you will need access to a pairing library over elliptic curves. So there is a reference posted in the ArcWorks algebra crate. You'll be working over the ArcWorks algebra crate to implement your own BLS signature. 
if I'm not mistaken, if you look further through this library, you should be able to see exactly how they do it in the reference implementation. But uh, I believe that you'll be able to search and find that for yourself. So uh, before leaving off, uh, are there any questions uh, about this week's lecture? Okay, I see a question typing in the chat, maybe. Okay, thank you, thank you. All right, um, that's been this week's lecture. I'll 